Well, hello there, young lady. How are you doing? It's nice to be here. It's me. Uh, I heard you've been talking all about me. It's me, former president Jimmy Carter. <laughs> heard you've been talking about me around the house. So Danny sent me an email. <laughs> and uh, Nancy, what's my wife's name? <laughs> she she answered my emails and she said, Danny and Jessica want you to be on City Hawkins Pod. And I said, sure thing. <laughs> Hello? Are you okay? <laughs> oh, President Carter, it is an absolute honor, sir. It's an absolute honor to meet you, too. <laughs> so good to be here. Talking about Reliant K. Well, I looked into them, and they rock. I'll say, they rock and roll. I like that rock and roll, and I like Reliant K. They're pretty good. So what song are we talking about today? <laughs> Today we're we're talking about a song off one of their more rockin' albums, which you should like, sir. Uh, five oh. score and seven years ago. It's called "I'm Taking You With Me." Oh, is this about Jesus? Uh, I don't know yet. We haven't talked about it yet. Well, let's go. I th- it, I, it was my understanding that I'm the new co-host. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sadie Hawkins Pod. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sadie Hawkins Pod. It's me, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's such an honor to have you here, sir. Taking time out of your your busy schedule, you have you do so much great humanitarian work, and you know between that and hanging out with Willie Nelson. <laughs> Jessica, are you okay? It's oh, me, Danny, God. doing oh, an impression of Jimmy oh, good Carter. Lord. <laughs> I feel so bad. I thought, like, oh, did she really think I'm Jimmy Carter? (laughs) Jessica watched a documentary about Jimmy Carter the other night, and then she just kept talking and talking and talking about (laughs) Jimmy Carter. But not just any time when she talked about it. It was, like, two in the morning. It was not, like, two in the morning. It was two in the morning. You were still awake. We were just laying in bed. No, I kept going to sleep, and then you're like, oh, and another thing about Jimmy Carter. (laughs) Great great man. Great, great man. Uh, Anyhow... Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sadie Hawkins Pod. Hello. We do have top of the show business this week. All right. Do you have anything you want to talk about? Just how you doing? How's it going? Ah, uh, you having going, a good time? Going, going well. It's I haven't going. seen you in a while. How you been? <laughs> <laughs> That's the go-to. Yeah. I haven't done that in a couple weeks. So, uh, we do have some voicemails. All righty. And then we have some messages about Man of Stone. So let's hear these voicemails oh, cool. first. Hi, this is Kendall from Nashville, and I'm taking you up on your generous offer to hear about our attendance of the um, Yeah Tour because I just need to tell somebody who gets it like I feel like I do. Um, I went to the last show in Nashville this past Saturday. Okay, I'm having deja vu because I swear we played this, but we might have like listened to it. Okay. In our, and then not actually aired it in the episode. So if this did okay. air in a previous episode, good news for Kendall. You get to hear it twice. I know we listened to this. I know. I'm like, oh, yeah. Did we not do this one last week? But that's exciting. Let's hear about it again. I think we What did we talk about last week? Was that Sonic? I don't remember. That was Man of Stone by oh, Matthew right, right, Tyson right. and Earthquakes. But I, th- okay. So if we did play this in a previous episode, apologies to everyone else except for Kendall because they're getting their voicemail played twice. So let's hear this. This story from the Nashville concert of Um Yeah. And it was lovely. Um, I echo a lot of the things that you all said. Many things were very similar. Similar was amazing. I think my husband and I were sitting next to her parents and watching them watch her was one of the sweetest things I've ever seen in my life. Um, And we also had a big resonance with the uh, youth group piece, which I know matches my experience. Um, Everybody really seemed to get that piece about the lock-ins. And the set list was very similar to what you all have talked about and what I've heard elsewhere, except that Prodigal and God kind of came as a package. And they pointed out some of the kind of more Nashville pieces of some of the songs. So uh, Wedgwood and Ape, which I know that you're – very familiar with having done the research when you were looking at that song. Um, Tyson kind of called out 
that that was a very Nashville song in Bunnen. That's right. And my number one thing, and you know, I've created a genius account for Sadie Hawkins pod now, so I need to go in there, but we need people to like go in who also have genius accounts and like approve our edits or credit them or whatever, or like vote that they seem accurate. I remember when we did bum in and that street corner that's mentioned someone on genius was like, Oh, there's a bar by that name two blocks away. He must mean that. Like, no, he doesn't. He means the actual... Wedgewood and 8th. Wedgewood and 8th, yeah. He's like, he was like, broke down on Wedgeworth and, Wedgewood and 8th, whatever. <laughs> and the genius annotation was like, this must be because there's a bar right there. Name that. Like a block and a half away. No. Name Bummin. Bummin. I didn't say it's not Bummin. I, just... <laughs> no, I was kidding. I just meant the bar name. <laughs> oh, the bar's name Bummin. No, the bar's name Wedgewood and 8th. Gotcha. But there's not talking about the bar. That's just a coincidence. He's talking about being broken down at the intersection. Anyway. But that's cute that you that you were seated near Samler's parents. That's awesome. That's that must great. have been fun. Yeah. We got lots of information about people being sa- standing next to and standing near friends and family of m- musicians on the tour, band members on the tour and Samler now. So interesting. It's exciting stuff. Yep. And uh, when he did Prodigal and God together, he talked about the this particular sermon that had inspired prodigal uh, that was preached at a church in Nashville that I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience were familiar with. So it was great. I loved it. Loved hearing you guys talk about it as well. And I totally agree that it felt like the last time that I saw them, we were all taking Reliant K for granted. And so it was really nice to see that they still have the same energy and that the shows still resonate like they always have looking forward to hopefully maybe someday more music but definitely more shows thanks for listening well that's super cool that's an awesome little tidbit about the sermon for the song prodigal yeah yeah especially because we haven't done that song yet so yeah. maybe we need to keep that in mind if there's a way to find out what specific uh sermon in church he was talking about yeah i love that i love getting all these little little snippets these little bits and pieces here and mm-hmm. there um, so That's thank you so fun. much for thank calling you. up, Kendall. Also, I guess, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm the only one who, like, went to churches and youth groups where they did not do the lock-in thing. Right. Yeah, just news to me. I only happened to have done one lock-in. I didn't do, I guess I did another thing that was like a lock-in, but it wasn't really a lock-in. Like, they drove between four different locations over the course of the night. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> so you all just got you were locked in a car is that what no I, it wasn't like or a, a bus it was like ostensibly a lock-in but it was like we start at the tennis court which it seems like weird but it's like a number uh-huh. like any place they could go with activity like we start for like two hours at the tennis court and everyone can play tennis or maybe they had volleyball there as well did this and go then, all night yeah and then they all load back in the bus and we go to the arcade and laser tag and then they nice. all load a couple hours there, and then they all load back in the bus, and then they we went to this to the roller rink. But at this oh, point, sick. but at this point, I was driving, so I actually <laughs> just followed the train. That's exciting. Because <laughs> there were younger kids in the thing. I was probably eighteen or nineteen. Just, well, now you just made it weird. I guess, but when you're eighteen or nineteen, you're still kind of going to youth group. Yeah, I I was. Yeah. yeah. So, but I could drive. I could have been driven. I could have been driving. I mean, I drove to youth group. Yeah, I got my license at sixteen, so I was driving my friend and I to to youth group every week. And so, yeah, yeah. But we didn't do a lot. I don't know. So I was eventually able to be like, I could like sign out, and it wasn't a church. It was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm going to sleep. It's just a situation I visited. It wasn't a church I attended. Mm. I'm just thinking that's the only other thing like a lock, and I did. But then the other one, I don't see how that's weird. (laughs) <laughs> it's just I was visiting a church. Why would you want to be stuck with people you don't know every night? Oh, all because night. we have to do the arcade and stuff. I don't know. Oh, that's that's a very good point. <laughs> I meant like, why would you? Because you I knew, knew that the arcade there. was going to be involved. Oh, I knew okay, like two I see, people I see. there. Sorry, that's I didn't just know my. Else. That's just my like social anxiety getting the better of me. Like, wait, so you don't know all these people? You don't hang out with them on a regular basis? Why would you? Why would you want to go to this? I see you had like two friends there, and you could go home when you wanted to. Right. So understand exactly. And I had work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you were when you and Matt Tyson were working at uh, Wendy's. Right. I'm trying to think. It was probably. I guess I just finished senior year, so I wasn't like. So it was really like the tail end of like. 
going to a youth group. It's probably I also went because it's like, oh, I get to do this thing. And I probably can't, don't have much more time to do these sort of things. Because right. I'm out mm. of high school now. Gotcha. Right. Like, like when do you stop trick-or-treating? <laughs> like, I think I trick-or-treated right after like 17 or something, which seems late. Yeah, like, I totally Nobody questions. Don't yeah. make, if you look young enough, and I always <laughs> looked young, like nobody really questions it. Yeah. You don't need to look like a little kid. There's always like preteens and stuff who were a lot or like you know 16 17 yeah 17 i think that's probably the at 18 i went dressed as the like a a more conservatively dressed version of uh janet during her in her stage show attire from the rocky horror picture show and i went trick-or-treating so (laughs) i mean i wore a skirt and like a t-shirt but still and another question when do you (laughs) stop seeing the pediatrician because i think i I saw i saw last saw the pediatrician Mm. when i was 18 Right. right. And that seems old, but like technically that was proper. Like I, I would, my doctor was a pediatrician through my entire adolescence. And then eventually I was 18 and they were like, okay, I, you're done here. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> Cause my parents didn't say to me one day, your it, my pediatrician was just my doctor, you know, just my doctor. I didn't think this is a pediatrician, but one day the doctor was like, you're done here now. You can, like, Ugh. go up to the desk or call in late to the hospital later and get I'm your sorry. regular piece, you know, your regular primary care physician. Right. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> my parents didn't, like, tell me this stuff happens, right? That's right? so funny. But I'm already taking myself. And I definitely felt like, oh, there's this is a kid's hospital. Definitely, like, when I'm 17 or 18 right. driving myself yeah. to the pediatrician. I'm like, <laughs> this is kind of weird. But, you know, I don't know. I wasn't, it was the only thing I'd ever known. As far as I know, he was a doctor. He was my doctor. Right, right, And yeah. then one day I go in and they're like, so you're done here. And I'm like, what? What do you mean by that? And it's like, you go, you got to go find a regular doctor now. And I'm like, you are my regular doctor. Right. We moved when I started high school and we saw a family physician. Okay. So we actually, when you and I relocated back to the greater Orlando area, I like drove back up to see my family doctor again. So. Right. <laughs> So all this to say that unlike Semler's song, I was not having sexual awakenings at that one particular <laughs> moving lock-in. So we have another voicemail here from Allie. Oh, and that last voicemail was from uh, April 4th. So, you know, it goes back a ways. And this one's from just uh, last week. Hey, guys, this is Allie. I'm listening to your Man of Stone episode right now. And I just wanted to point out that... Um, uh, the Wikipedia page for Matt Houston does mention his divorce at the bottom of the personal life section. So that's how I learned about it. I didn't even know um, that it happened until shortly after they announced they were going on tour. And I was just kind of digging around looking at the Internet and read about it. So um, just thought I'd throw that little tidbit out there because I think you mentioned that you couldn't find it um, on Wikipedia pages or, you know, wherever you were looking at. But it's there if you want to go look. Anyway, uh, thanks again for another great episode. Bye. So I won't pretend that I didn't listen to this particular voicemail ahead of time. I did listen to this voicemail ahead of time because I'll see the translations or the, the, the transcripts in the email when I know we got a voicemail. And usually I'm just like, okay, it looks like a regular voicemail. I'm going to archive the email and I'll check the voicemail on the show. Well, as soon as I saw that this was about the Wikipedia for Matt Thiessen and mm-hmm. mentioning that he had been divorced from his previous wife. I was like, okay, let me see about this. Because, would, and this this will feed back into our follow-up from last week's episode, Man of Stone, because I do have more notes from our Man of Stone discussion from Adam Goff, who sent them to us by, by, by a written message. So when we started this podcast... <laughs> Tyson, any again, I got I always got to preface this by like I'm not like a person who likes to dig into the personal lives of people. At the very least, like okay, I know they're divorced. Okay, I know that now. I know that puts context to some of this music. Blah blah blah. I don't care about getting into the deep personal information about people. Other fans do. I've seen that in all the fandoms I've been a part of, like Blink One Eighty Two and. And uh, um, uh, maybe I haven't seen as much of that in Eminem. M&M? You like Eminem? M&M. <laughs> Is that where you were going? Yeah. They might be giants for sure. Like people who like really want to know everything there is to know about the person's personal life. I don't need to know that. But when we started this podcast in the summer of 2019, there was no mention on 
Thiessen or Emily Wright's Wikipedia is that they had been divorced. So when we, when people started telling us, oh, they got divorced, and oh, Wind Up Bird is about his divorce, I was like, what? I don't understand. Yeah. And then people were like, I well, think like, we had done a few episodes where we were we talked about, about them like as being married, married. And this and that, and then eventually, I think it popped up in a in a deep dive where it was the uh, the like divorce ledger or whatever from Tennessee right, came up, above. and we were like, oh wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's so that's getting into what I'm <laughs> what I figured out here. So it was not on the Wikipedia for a long time. Someone finally went in and added it. And I looked because here Ali says it was it's on the Wikipedia. And I went and I was like, who added it? And it's there now on both their Wikipedia pages. And like, when was this added? It was added in like some point in 2021. Some point last year, it was at, finally added. And it mm. quotes that uh, Nashville or Tennessee Ledger newspaper, right? So I'm like, okay, someone finally added it. Because it was a private matter. They didn't want to make it public. Then it's clearly, he shows that he's got a girlfriend on his Instagram now, so it's not as private. And of course, they're not going to have a press release talking about it, whatever. I get it. Someone went in there and added it. But when we did look on up, yeah, we were doing deep dives trying to figure out when was this song written, and you and, and you and me found that thing. And it's not even like a news article about their divorce. It's the court ledger that gets published in this yeah. local newspaper of all the court cases that happened in the last week. And one of them was like Wright v. Thiessen and divorce under the divorce section. We're like, oh, okay, there's confirmation for that. And now I'm wondering if someone listened. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be egotistical. It could have, Someone else could have found that same article hidden deep in the internet. But part of me wonders... If we did our Look On Up episode and we talked about that, or if it was a follow-up from the Look On Up episode, and we talked about that and someone heard it and went into Wikipedia and referenced that newspaper and added those things in there. Plus, I'll say, last thing I just want to say on this. Okay. It gets added to their Wikipedias <laughs> to, to, to show how we, as not, not being very nosy on this stuff, were set up to not figure this out. It's not on their Wikipedias. It's not like really front-facing public information that they've been divorced. They divorced in 2018. Right. They divorced before we started this podcast. Yes. And the information, ostensibly it being on Wikipedia, makes it more front-facing to the world at large now. It didn't end up front-facing information to the world for three years right. <laughs> until it got added last year. Right. So it's just interesting how like they were like private matter... Don't whatever. And then I'm like, did we like, and it doesn't seem like it matters, the privacy of it. Everyone kind of knows now. But as far as it getting added to the Wikipedia, did we have a hand in that? Or did someone just find it on their own as well and add it? Or did someone in... You could put their two names together in the Google and it, it, it will come yeah, but up. You, ha- so. you had to specifically do that. And then you had to notice what is well, this some folks newspaper? like like knowing about about the personal lives of their favorite musicians and celebrities and such. Just because you and I don't buy Us Weekly or People or any of those other magazines <laughs> doesn't mean that other folks don't. Well, that's all about that. So we do have notes from Adam Goff about Man of Stone. And of course, Adam was one of the only was the only cover that we found. There was another cover on Instagram that we found that I just want to credit really quick. I posted it on our Instagram. But uh, St- uh, Steph Wood, she also had a cover, but it was posted to Instagram, and I can't search covers on Instagram. I've tried in the past, and it's just so difficult. Even now that Instagram technically has text search, it doesn't really work. So it's just not like, it's not really possible. So here are Adam's notes on our Man of Stone, Matt Thiessen, and the Earthquakes discussions. My, my braces feel very in the way tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Adam left these on our YouTube account, on our YouTube posting of this episode, which is the first time anyone's done that. I guess that's a pretty useful way to leave notes on the episodes. Mm-hmm. Like I'll, I get an email when the message is left in the comments, so and that probably helps something (laughs) so if people want to start leaving comments in the youtube uploads of these episodes please do i manually upload our youtube things it's not part of the podbean stuff i mean i probably could pay some service to do it automatically but i just generate the video myself and upload it to youtube and i don't know why i'm just like 
it's probably a way for like even a couple people find us that way whatever anyway i think that might be how uh, our corporate overlord came across us oh maybe or uh or our corporate overlord's brother oh okay i because I, I also i do I, i'm a little more uh uh on a on a bashed is that the phrase unashamed on YouTube, I put in the title of every episode, parenthetical, Reliant K podcast. Gotcha. <laughs> I don't just, I just, I like sell it if you run across it. Uh, so Adam Goff said about Man of Stone, in the musicality, in musicality, you'd call the diddly diddlies hammers. Oh, there you go. So we talked about the diddly diddly, like, mm-hmm. so those were, ha- I guess, like hammers on the guitar. Right, like hammer-on. Hammer-ons. Yeah. Like I know that in the metal sense. Is it the same is a hammer on yes. the same as a hammer? Okay. And then he said, I have thoughts about this song. Verse two is about tattoos, which I think we touched on. Mm-hmm. But I was kind of back and forth and thinking like the ink. You you mentioned the ink on divorce paper. I said right. the ink. And what did I say? It was another one that I said. You definitely brought up the tattoo thing. Okay. But uh, there's more uh, lyrics here that I don't think we decoded to the tattoo uh, interpretation. The lyrics are, you had your ink, but you think you might have taken it too far before forsaking it. You covered up your nakedness. The covered up your nakedness. I get it. Like tattoos cover up skin. Uh, Adam continues. It's about getting a surplus of tattoos covering your naked skin before getting them removed. The reason you have so many tattoos is because you've been dating around without committing you had the names of your girls tattooed on your arms. Oh, is that the names of the girls in the song? Laura, Lauren, Lorelai, oh, or whatever God. they were. <laughs> I know I didn't get it right, but more or less. Right. <laughs> and you can't lie to your new partner about it because they can see your history written on your skin. Ah, it's n- And then okay. to quote the song, it's not a sin... When your skin is telling everything, how could you ever lie about the girls you've been trying out? Laura, Laura, Lori, Laura, Lauren, Rose. I think the, and then uh, Adam continues, I think the certain clothesline is just, close, certain clothesline, oh, curtain. I think the curtain clothes <laughs> line is about having nothing left and being forced to live thrifty because you weren't taking your life seriously. That makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Because this song was so much... That song was so much more abstract that it did... I really couldn't understand the context of the girls you've been trying out. Lori, Lauren, Laura Rose, or whatever. And, like, my first... And it's... I didn't think that it was this. But because the, like, the... The point of view in the song kind of shifts. I was like... When he says you, he's talking about himself. He's talking to him, he, the narrator. Right. I'm just going to say the narrator, not specifically the lead singer of the band, but the narrator of the song, the voice of the song, says you in the royal sense, apparently, in Adam's yeah. interpretation yeah. here, which definitely threw me off. I, you know, I don't think, and I'll be interested when we do more Wind Up Bird songs, aside from the abstractions in Man of Stone... There is also that riddling way in which the point of view seems to shift. I, I feel like he's talking in the first person, right? But then talking about himself in the second person, and and that's not and uncommon in forth. Reliant K songs either for it's, the narrator oh, to sort of switch around a little bit. Okay. I think we've noticed in the past, especially with sort of the more abstract songs. Okay, I guess this time it was just a lot more puzzling or... i mean i should say i shouldn't say it's not uncommon it is uncommon but it has happened before right and i guess when it's happened in relying k songs it was just easier to kind of figure out unlike this song which every line that song last week was every line was basically a riddle right but we're not talking about that song. We're not, we not taking Man of Stone with us any further into this episode. <laughs> Instead, what we're taking into this episode is I'm taking you with me from Reliant K's 2007 album, Five Score and Seven Years Ago. Suggest so you know why we picked this song. <laughs> I think we mentioned it last week. 
Or maybe in a Patreon or something. Because I never remember that this song exists. And every time it pops on, I think I'm listening to a song I've never heard before. Uh, I was working on, and also, that's also sort of top of the show business, is that we took a bunch of videos from the Um Ya Tour and just like our time around the Um Ya Tour. Mm -hmm. And I finally put all of that together and threw some Reliant K music over certain parts. But it also has all of our uncut, like, Instagram stories and stuff like that and what we took of the performances. Mm -hmm. And... I don't, I don't know how we're going to make that available. but Probably it, on the YouTube and then maybe yeah. like put clips from it on yeah. the social media. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll post so it we'll, so people uh, can see it this week. Yeah. So you have a bunch of Danny and I just being goofy in there as well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but if you fast forward a little, you get to just like, you know, clips of the performances and such. So right. while I was doing that, I was listening to different songs to figure out what to to throw under the, uh, the other parts. And I was like... Put on this song, and I texted Danny a screen cap of me listening to this song, and I was like, I never remember this song. She says, ever. I don't think I've ever heard this song. As a joke. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, I don't think I've ever heard this Reliant K song before, as a joke, because I was like, I never remember this one. This and I Need You off this album. I feel like I Need You never. is more of a hit, or more of a hit within, within like the fandom itself. But I will say... That, yeah, this song is probably the most lost in the... This might be this might be seem rude to say, because I don't feel that five score and seven years ago is cluttered. But this is, like, the most lost in the clutter. You know what I mean? Yeah. The most lost in the rest of the album songs. And as far as I could tell, they've never played this song live. So it does seem to be, like, this song just kind of filled out the album. And it's not just me, because... Uh, this was again it's it's tied up there for like shortest deep dive all we have are song meanings and that is it absolutely nothing else came up for me for this song Mm. well yeah i think this this seems to just be an album cut like in the classical sense of we wrote this song so it can exist on the album and that we don't have any other intentions with this song right i wonder if like so you know lots of bands have songs that aren't intended as album cuts, but other bands do. Band, some bands will be like, every song they write is intended to like be part of their catalog and could maybe be played someday. But then a lot of bands will just like in the studio, they're like, we need some more songs in here. We need this kind of song to measure out, you know, this part of the track list. We need a slower song. We need a faster song for the bridge between here. Say I saw an album like Five Score and Seven Years Ago. Nope, that's the album we're doing this week. Forget Not Slow Down. An album like Forget Not Slow Down doesn't seem to have any fat. I guess that's the idea. Fat. Some albums have fat. But if, you, if you're a carnivore, if you like steak, fat's delicious. Fat fills in the flavor and the marbling and all that. But also, fat is the least nutritious and you just kind of forget it. So this is a song that I can absolutely see certain people really liking. And I have really liked this song a lot, listening to it, like focusing on it, but it is just a song that among all these other bigger songs, especially because this song is so late in the album. Yeah, definitely. Really gets lost. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, so I kind of feel like this song sounds like three different songs in one. It (laughs) feels kind of disjointed. Like the chorus doesn't really sound like the rest of of the song overall and I, yeah i don't know if this was just kind of like you said just they're just trying to round out the album or something and and saying that i still i enjoy parts of this song just not all of them threaded together i guess okay. like the song starts off well enough and then at 50 seconds in the chorus kicks in and i just like find it such a jarring shift like Like, we're going in one direction, and then we suddenly take a hard right. Mm -hmm. And it's not even that it doesn't sound like Reliant K. These sound like different parts of Reliant K. It just doesn't sound all (laughs) together like the same era. Maybe I would say that this sounds like if you put Reliant K into an AI, this is a song it would create. (laughs) Yes. Because this does have a lot of DNA of other... Reliant K songs and other things that Reliant K already did on this album. You know what I mean? Like, 
I, we've definitely talked about other songs on like five score. Maybe I said this about um, Devastation and Reform, and I think Daniel called up and he had a different uh, thought on what this song I'm talking about would be. But the song that kind of like feels like the sum of all the parts of an album, and some and you know usually and when we've talked about that before, that's usually a good thing. Like this song represents the album. Like this one song on mm-hmm or two lefts or whatever this song encapsulates the varied ideas found in all the other songs in one song right sometimes that can be a good thing but i think in this case and we're being really hard on this song but i have a lot of i have positive things to say about it as well but i think this song is like the opposite version of that it's just like all the encapsulation of the album into like the the version that blends into the background it's like a blue shirt on a blue wall it's like this song sounds so much like this album that it just it fades into the background and it always has for me uh i'm way more focused on it now like i definitely i feel like i know this song better now than ever before but another comparison i thought about is because we did the church jams now podcast and we went through an entire album discussion of two lefts we um, I think we all agreed, the five of us in that podcast, that the song from end to end on two lefts is oh, like the I most f- deep cut on that album. And the song that is like the least Reliant K of that time, like to that song's benefit from end to end, we said, this almost sounds like something that's meant for mm-hmm or five score. But here it is in the first three gears era and that's interesting to see something that is much more five score on two lefts but it's just like the most like miss listened to most ignored song on that album probably i'm like i said every song i'm sure has its fans i mean i did find like youtube videos there are songs in relying k's discography where i didn't even find a single youtube video like not a single cover or not a single like AMV right. or FMV. So there are definitely songs that have that have no appreciation from that aspect of it, and this song does. So this song is like from end to end, but from end to end is like a whole. It completely sounds different than the rest of the album. But here, I'm taking you with me. Sounds like all the album, and so it becomes white noise to me. Until I focus in on it at like a single, like listening to it over and over and over. Um, but now I do kind of like this song, which I guess that's a spoil to our ending <laughs> question. Um, I, I take, I, I like the lyrics, but I do take issue a little bit with like the just the very first chunk. I made a habit of never making promises that aren't easy to keep. Bad friend Thiessen. <laughs> is a character in this universe right bad friend teason messes up and uh even bad christian teason messes up and it feels like there's a lot of songs that imply if not directly state that you made a lot of promises promises that they have not kept so (laughs) i did think of that as well that's funny and i mean this song is like a romantic song this is a secular song it is about a girl especially off of our discussion last week from our two-star review (laughs) i feel a little um a little cautious saying that but like this this one it's about a girl he's singing or he's or at the very least it's about a relation it's about a romantic relationship and how you're counting the time between seeing them and there are individual lines that could be interpreted i was gonna say to the counterpoint there are lines where you could absolutely interpret them as being you know about god right and the phrase i'm and to say i'm taking you with me you could write a like spiritual christian song with that concept because when you give your heart to god he and you give your heart to christ He's always there with you. You're taking him with you everywhere you go. And at the worst, you forget you're sanctified. You forget you're saved. And so it doesn't feel like God's there with you because you kind of let that, you know, you let that realization slip away from you in a moment where you're overstressed or worried about things. But the way in which 
in this song, he's talking about I'm taking you with me doesn't really occur to me as something eternal. <laughs> right. This is a very, like, very um, mortal song. It's very much of, it sounds about like, I'm not around with you and I can't wait to get back to you. And there's the miles in between us, which I guess could all be metaphorical, but I'm pretty yeah. sure there are lyrics in here that very much make it like when I'm away from you, I can't get back to you until I find the time to get back to you, which is not how a relationship with Christ works. If you are feeling distant from the Lord, you can take the time then to realize, to pray, or to at the very least, if you're feeling forsaken and disconnected, you know, and you are have a lot of faith at the very least you at that moment say well god is with me right now even if i don't 100 percent feel it and that's not the way in which he's singing i'm taking you with me here in this song right and i'm and so i'm trying to hold it all together and make it through the day when i'm just dying to drop it all and take your hand so we can run away and all the miles and the hours that seem to endlessly devour the time that i could be with you right is is definitely to the the more it's like of a I mean, girlfriend song yeah. yeah like in this context of it being relying k and sung by matt Thiessen and written by matt Thiessen, you're like okay the life of being in relying k is keeping him from her but you could take this same idea and make it to anything like i gotta go to work i mean you I'll could view it, it as being like hours. you know it's a tough life out on the road i feel really disconnected from god and i just want to get you know, back to a place that makes me feel more in touch with the Lord. Right. You could view it that way if you wanted. You could. <laughs> if you want to. That's that nothing's nothing's gonna stop you now. Nothing's gonna stop us now. When you just uh, thinking about this is also like um about life on the road and, and got to get back to you. It makes me think circus life yes. under the yeah. big t- <laughs> Well this could be about circus life. What if it's about being at the circus and like I gotta Ow. hit the road and Ow. sorry I get shot out of a cannon and or I get sh- I get I get shot with a cannon. I was trying to reference Homer Simpson from the Lollapalooza episode. Sorry about that loud ouch. I uh, <laughs> got a very bad scrape on my arm the other day and mm. I just set uh, my arm down the wrong way on the table. So apologies for that. <laughs> or uh, like Beth uh, by Kiss similar right similar vibes similar vibes there so i'll say like the bridge also has that it's, it's, it's just sort of faithfully by journey is also the the song that you're looking for right 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 the big top <laughs> song <laughs> so the bridge in this song which is just right isn't this just more of the lyrics from earlier in the song kind of rephrased a little bit every second that goes by is one more second of my life oh no these are slightly different lyrics but it's very focused on one particular theme. But then musically, the bridge does that ba 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 ba. It does the uh, must have done something right thing. Right. This is like a slightly less poppy, more rockin' must have done something right bridge, which just kind of sells it's that to Beach me. Beach Boys kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, the Beach Boys thing. But the and bridge the to this and the bridge to must have done something right, they they sound so similar. I mean, done must have done something right. I mean, whether you like that song or not, you know. That is a very, that is a song stands out among Relying K's discography. That has a unique sound for Relying K. But this is so many other elements blended together. And even and one of the elements blended together here, I think, is the Beach Boys must have done something right bridge added together with this sort of like driving, uh, not crunchy, but kind of like driven, like punk pop, like, chord downstroke thing so it's just like yeah it's just wallpaper (laughs) i like this song it's just like the most middling song i feel on the album i just and 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 i think you can tell because i feel like i don't have as much to say as i would about a normal song Mm -hmm. which is interesting that we've done this song brings about as much energy as you and i are bringing to this episode i think i'm bringing a lot of energy thank you very much (laughs) But I mean, what are we Sorry, now? 100? I apologize. I'm just projecting. <laughs> Sometimes you're like, oh, we're not doing so good. And I listen to the episode. And it's like, we're doing fine. And then the reviews come in and everyone's like, oh, you guys suck. <laughs> so 
So we're 140 episodes in now, right? And technically, the last two episodes we did weren't Relying K songs. <laughs> One definitely wasn't Relying K. It wasn't Relying K at all. Oh, and then we did the Deathbed episode. So out of um, so out of like 138 Relying K songs we've done, it's interesting to get to one where I really don't feel super positive about the song, but don't hate it. Because like, I don't like local construction. I really don't like local construction, but I also know that's me because I see the fans <laughs> of that song, which now include John Schneck. He's talked about liking playing that song. I think he talked to us about it when we talked to him outside of the Boston venue that he likes playing that song. And I'm like, it's a great song. I know a lot of people like it, fun. <laughs> but you know, I can't, I can say I don't enjoy local construction, but I understand that other people do. But then I'm taking you with me is just so gray it's just so there and i'm sure some people out there like it but i just don't have a ton to say about it so but it's interesting after 137 specific reliant k songs to actually be coming back to this sort of blase feeling it's interesting that you know this is a band that we're like everything they you know by statistically everything reliant k releases is pretty on a pretty above above par above (laughs) par (laughs) well yeah, yeah. I was like, technically, you want to come in under par, but I, it's different. Yeah. Par. I see what you're doing there. Well, there are at least 27 people over on Song Meanings who have feelings about this song. So okay. we'll get to some of them after we take our break. Okay. We just want to take a moment to thank you for listening to Sadie Hawkins Pod. Whether you've been listening for a while or this is your first time, we want to hear your thoughts on this episode, your corrections, and your Relying K memories at our voicemail line, which is 402-95-SADY. And if talking on the phone isn't your thing, because I know it's not mine, and whose is it really, you can send us an email to sadiehawkinspod at gmail.com, or visit our socials at Instagram and Twitter, which are both at sadiehawkinspod. While there, you can also see the visuals we discuss on the podcast each week. You can also visit sadiehawkinspod.com for for easy access to all these links, as well as to our merch store for shirts, mugs, stickers, and more. We also want to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash Sadie Hawkins pod, who include Isaac, James, Kendall, Josh A, Timothy, Daniel, Jay, Eric, Joel, Connor, Michael, Samantha, Jimmy Eat Pod, This Might Be a Podcast, Tucker, and Brady. Join our Patreon now for two monthly bonus episodes, our entire backlog of bonus episodes, which include reviews of the case for karaoke songs and chapters of the complex infrastructure known as the Female Mind Book. You'll also get stickers, guitar picks, and a special Patreon exclusive shirt when you've donated a lifetime contribution of $60. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Where can I sign up again? At patreon.com slash Sadie Hawkins pod. If you want to be a patron of the arts, the fine arts, the podcast arts, there's one place to go. SadieHawkinsPod.com slash... Oh, wait. No, no, that's not it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I panicked. Uh, So, yeah, this week uh, I kept thinking as I needed to do my deep dive. I'm like, right. I need to do my I need you deep dive. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kept getting, I definitely conflate these two when I remember that either song exists. Well, there are so many songs that, there's so many words. We gotta do it like So many titles. There's so many, but there are words that reappear reappear in Reliant K songs all the time. Up, hate, need. Like, I gotta make one of those word clouds of these are the words that appear in... Relying K, and I could do. And this then you easily could make it Excel. really JPEGged, and you could use it in like <laughs> uh, hotel bathroom right. art. Uh, so, delete this account on February tenth, two thousand seven. Said Matt sings about a girl, plain and simple. Quite a good song. I'd be wooed. Uh, Penguin ninety two on February twenty seventh, two thousand seven. Said if home is where the heart is, then my home is where you are but it's getting oh so hard to spend these days without my heart. Catchiest line on the album, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, there's good stuff in this song. There is definitely good stuff, but I do feel like this was an album filler. And I love that Reliant K delivers. So they delivered a good song 
that is still to me album filler and it's telling to me that they've never played this song live at least not in a way that was ever recorded it's not on i checked setlist fm and i didn't find anything on youtube or anything like that so unless they do a five score album show eventually i would wonder like what's like the deepest cut album filler on because mm-hmm? it seems like that album is front to back like a banger right but also you know another album so i just want to talk about album filler for a second okay dookie that album is pretty much referred to as like a front to back perfect album Right, Mm -hmm. but there are songs on there that to Green Day were essentially album filler Mm because there's a lot of songs on there that they never played or would play like once every five, ten years. You know what I mean? There's a couple of songs on there, like there's the big hits, obviously, and then there's the second tier stuff that they've always played, like She and things that were technically singles but didn't have videos and weren't really on the radio a lot until now. But I'm trying to remember what are some of the other songs on Dookie. Having a Blast, that one's early. Pulling Teeth. Sassafaris Roots. I'm just looking. (laughs) Enemus Sleepus. In the End. Like, these are songs that, like, they didn't play when Dookie came out. And they didn't play for a long time until, like, Dookie-specific shows happened, basically. So, like, now I'm thinking, like, you know, an album that's perfect, like Dookie, has songs that the band just kind of wrote to fill in the album like they had no big intention of playing those songs live so i mean I, i'm actually now i think about it is like five score maybe the album that's been played live the least maybe collapsible lung in five score mm, i think and we don't have perfect data on this because we don't we have... saw them a lot during the five score era it's just they were playing a lot of mm-hmm still as well as right. first three gear stuff. It's kind of an interesting transitional time. I mean, it feels like they're always changing and growing, but that is sort of like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we've definitely heard them play a lot of five score songs live before. I'd but... have to look at the list, but now I'm wondering if even on, um, yeah, five score is of the albums they played, like other than collapse of a lung is five score. The album that they, they only played those couple of singles and they didn't play any deep cuts. Like, cause even air for free, I mean, they toured the least with Air for Free, probably, right. because you only had, like, a year of it, so. Right. But but they played a lot of Air for Free on Um Yeah. They did, yeah. Absolutely. So, I don't know. Well, R.K. Ile on Ma- March 6, 2007 said, after so many recent songs of saying, I suck at relationships, Maddie is finally in love. Aw. So, a lot of, you know, like, so at least these first three yeah. commenters have been like, hey, this song is about a girl. And then we get to Matt Thea, not Judas, on March 8th, 2007, who said, <laughs> I'm not so sure that this is about a girl. Doesn't I'm taking you with me seem a little bit off to say to a girl? No, it literally doesn't. <laughs> a lot of people get mad when they hear this, but I think this song may be about God. If home is where the heart is, then my home is where you are. That yeah, could just as I mean, easily be about Christ as about a girl. Absolutely. The line, I'm literally dying without you here, cinches it too. Songs are up for interpretation and RK does write songs about girls. I'm just not sure this one is about a girl. Well, if that's the YouTube reviewer that, I mean, the iTunes reviewer that gave us two stars, um, then I won't harp on it. But you absolutely would say I'm taking you with me, right? Like that's like a romantic moment in a in a in a in a romantic movie where it's like they're gonna run away together. I'm taking you with me. I'm go- I gotta move to Poughkeepsie to open up to 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 because my job's moving me there. But you know what? I'm taking you with me. But also, I'm taking you with me is a negative phrase because I also put together and I already tweeted this before we started recording. But the if you paired the song together with when I go down. And then I'm taking you with me. It would be when I go down, I'm taking you with me. The phrase I'm taking you with me kind of is a negative connotation anyway. In most sen- in, in a lot of senses, you'd hear that phrase. It's like, I'm taking you with me. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she was looking ahead at what's... What yeah, I'm just... Up. Sorry, I was just scanning ahead uh, the song. But meetings. I do agree with... I do agree with not Judas there. Or not... What was their name? Whatever their name was. I do agree with them that some of those lines do sound, can be taken spiritually easily. 
DM Shocker on March 9th, 2007 said, hmm, I think this song is just great. It is so controversial and you can look at it one way to make it seem like it's about a girl and you can look at it another way to make it seem like it's about God. Also, I think this song is very catchy. Smiley face. I do. Is think this song catchy. controversial? I don't think so. It's just kind of like... Maybe a, it's just like controversial like kinda, in their life. Song. Maybe like in their community, in their church, in their family. People talk about this song like, I don't like this song. I don't want to hear this song. <laughs> Like, I still to this day carry with me this idea that Chick Magnet is, like, like the most uh, controversial relying, uh, MXPX song for two reasons. One is because MTV did this report, which I saw back, and it recently got on YouTube, but I saw it back in the time where, like, they were talking about the up, the rise of Christian punk and people and they interviewed these people at some christian festival these teens who were like upset that chick magnet was so secular but then and he definitely did not see this mtv news report and i think it was actually before that because it was right after life in general came out one of my youth pastors at this one particular church was very upset at the existence of chick magnet he thought it was very wrong for them to write that song so if this person that you just read is just like in their personal community this song is controversial then whatever but nobody talks about this song it can't be it can't be controversial if nobody talks about this song well this is at least one person's favorite song burr e. yent on june 9th 2007 said just because reliant k have christian members in them doesn't make them a christian band quote unquote a band can't be saved making it not christian and this is what they want happening that's why they don't call themselves christian genre because that will limit what they write just because the members are christians does not limit them from writing about a girl in fact it's not bad at all to write about a girl it's just he, he the it's just the context of it that could be bad but this song is open for interpretation i think it has to do with a girl enjoy it's my favorite song from their album right now so yeah <sighs> smiley face brian uh and then xx underscore songbird x underscore xx on who i think june, we've heard i remember i feel like i remember that name on june 9th 2007 said yeah Matt T wrote a lot of mushy love songs in their latest CD because he's got a new girlfriend. Get the CD and read the thank yous. <laughs> so there's that. XAQ27 on November 15th, 2007 said, For some reason, this is an unusual type of song for Reliant K to sing. The style of this music seems a bit different than what they've done in the past. Whatever. Cool song. I don't, I don't necessarily think that. I think it's just them kind of mashing up a couple of their different types of things. Like, I, I don't know. For some reason, the chorus almost strikes me as a little, like, first three gearsy, whereas the rest of the song feels very, very current in five score. And then some of the lyrics, not the lyrics, but some of the vocals almost feel collapsible lung-like. So I, I think it... I, oh, right. I there know. is it like just, a... You, we were listening to the song together and you were like, he is singing so high almost yeah. falsetto that you weren't i mean not here maybe at the beginning look i'm just gonna say it controversial opinion you're singing at the higher it's slightly higher end of his range you, danny loves falsetto t i do i like i love ptl <laughs> i'm not i'm not a fan i'm not a fan i know, of that. I know it's such a shame I'm sorry controversial i know but yeah i don't know just not my thing well, I also forgot to mention also that this... the harmonizing, but that that comes from the whole not being a huge fan of uh, acapella. You know, Danny is currently playing with uh, a Sonic toy. A Sonic toy. Jessica on the bought table. me a Stretch Armstrong Sonic, and I squished him down like a like a burger, and you, I pretended I was instead about to of bite rolling him. him into a ball. Oh yeah, you could, oh, I didn't think of that. I could roll him into a ball. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like he does in the games. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I I cut you off because I had not finished my thought. What were you What were you saying? I don't know. It's very rude for you to cut me off. I never do that to you. I was gonna say. <laughs> I remember now. I was gonna say there's also a lot of piano in this song, right? So there's like a crunchy. It's not crunchy in like the grungy sense, but it's just like da, 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 that opening like downstroke punk thing. 
a lot of piano, a lot of Beach Boys influence. So it's so much Reliant K stuff, and it just is like that AI Reliant K song. Yeah, too much, too much Reliant K stuff. Pick pick one of the one or two of the Reliant K things. It also made me wonder. <laughs> so I was like, is this what Andrew McMahon music sounds like? Because we did that Patreon episode right. with Polly Cy Alex. So those three songs from a later Jack's Mannequin album that Teeson is credited on. But I still haven't like taken that step into actually listening to like regularly any Jack's Mannequin or something corporate. So I did listen to some something corporate, like the Out the Bedroom Window or whatever that album's called. And I was like, okay, this album does kind of sound like this song, I'm Taking You With Me. And I think what we figured out about Andrew McMahon and Matt Thiessen's relationship is I think they kind of, their their influences kind of cross-pollinated with each other, right? Because I wasn't, I never really was an Andrew McMahon fan at all. <laughs> I just never even knew who he was. I'd seen that Jack's, that one Jack's Mannequin album with the, the beach. I'd seen that cover in a million stores, but it never occurred to me that that was adjacent to pop punk in any way. So I never right. even looked into it. But then I figured, I, I think our assumption at this point is like he's become friends with Andrew McMahon and Andrew McMahon has these leanings, leaning, getting ready to be done i guess i guess poly Cy alex or maybe even david park would help us figure out that this is correct but like he's getting ready to start he's starting jack's mannequin he's doing jack's mannequin he's developing this different style aside from what was exactly in something corporate and at the same time he's friends with matt Thiessen, and matt Thiessen is friends with him and matt Thiessen is also leaning towards more like pop rock pop punk with piano stuff so i think they're influences kind of cross pollinated each other at this time and then also on this album you had a lot of influence from brand new which was like the band that was like influencing a lot of people at the time so i don't know i just feel like and i feel like it all just kind of like this is like the 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 piece in the middle everything Everything in transit is the album with the beach on it from jack's mannequin well, thank you for looking that up. So, so we're an hour in. I feel like we're almost ready to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's time for your YouTube dive. Like so, I said, very short uh, deep dive this week. I'll make sure to make this my section last for a good hour or so. <laughs> so here's a song that was... I, I don't feel like we talked a lot of... I don't feel like we got as in-depth with the song this week as we normally would. I feel like we scratched the surface, but I just feel like it's a surface level song. And I feel bad because I've never ragged on a Reliant K song, like a canonical Reliant K song, this badly. It's just... And I've enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. A canonical Reliant K song. You know, like everything's (laughs) canonical, but I feel like when we like tear apart the Butterfinger Cup song, it's because that was like very clearly written as like a lark and it was written quickly and recorded I thought you were talking about collapsible lungs, so... That's canonical. That's the canon. That's canon in D. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> so do you remember the movie My Idiot Brother? Yes. With Paul Rudd and yeah. maybe Rashida Jones or something? Or maybe it was... Who was in that? Who I is... don't know. We didn't see it. But yes, yeah, I'm familiar. Hold on. My... All oh, right. I take it back. This is the other thing that popped up in my, uh, okay, in my deep dive. I sent it to you. Oh, you did? Yes, because it was on a website that was not YouTube. And I was like, I don't think this is at all related to Reliant K, but I'm sending it to you so that you have it. They, it must be a, uh, they must have also posted it to YouTube. Okay. All right. I was right. Rashida Jones is in this movie, but I guess the sister is actually Elizabeth Banks, or maybe there's multiple characters and they've all got the same brunette hair. So it's very confusing. (laughs) I can see how they all look similar. Okay. Anyway, from the song My Idiot Brother on the soundtrack, and I just didn't know that there was a promotional soundtrack song by Mindy Smith from 2011, and this has only got 279,000 views, so this was not, like, a hit. Uh, This was, like, a music video tie-in to the movie Our Idiot Brother. Okay, look at this poster. Wait, I can't. I can't. I click. I clicked a. I clicked a clip from 
Look at this poster. Look at this poster. It's a teeny tiny little poster oh, on the YouTube. Right. Okay? I did not realize They've that all that got brunette wrong. flat hair, the three women sitting next to Paul Rudd. I see. It's very tiny. And I can't because make it's anyone so tiny, out. <laughs> tell me which one is Rashida Jones. Tell oh, me which one is Elizabeth Banks. And tell me which one is some it. third lady. That one's Rashida Jones. Because I'm not, I, I know right that. Right there. I don't know who the other two are. I know Rashida Jones isn't white, but. She just looks they 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 made they made their characters have the exact same haircut. For some reason, when you said this this movie, all I could imagine was the poster for what is that Dan in real life? The one oh, where yeah. Steve Carell is sleeping on the pancakes. Well, he's not sleeping, but he's got his head rested on the pancakes. Yeah, what was this what was this particular subgenre of movies? These like um, not Judd Apatow movies. Yeah, but these not Judd Apatow pseudo dramas. These right. dramedies from the Judd Apatow clan. Right. But they weren't meant as like laugh out loud comedies. They were meant as like, as like, and they weren't meant as like sad dramas, but they were meant as like quirky, slightly depressing genres. Maybe this also shoots out of the mumblecore genre. Maybe this is like, maybe this is, maybe movies like My Idiot Brother and Dan in Real Life are like, you know, Mumblecore was a thing and we'll take that idea of like regular life stories, but we'll cast it with all of the Judd Apatow camp to give, make it look more commercial and we'll make fun looking posters, but the movies won't be fun. Does dinner and for Jeff who lives at home was another one. Right. Does dinner for idiots I think or whatever that was Dinner for schmucks called? I think That's is more it. meant as a wild comedy. Okay. The, is our idiot brother not supposed to be a comedy cuz it looks No, it is a comedy. I'm not saying these the... things are comedies, okay. but I'm just saying there was this subgenre within the comedy genre of the 2010s where you have outrageous hilarious comedies, right? Like like Step Brothers and uh 40 year old virgin and even some of those movies have more realistic grounded concepts than others but they're all meant as like laugh out loud laugh every scene movies whereas movies like my idiot brother which i've never seen (laughs) and dan in real life and jeff who lives at home these were all meant as like take the same cast but make an even more grounded thing which will have a laugh like every 20 minutes if you're lucky and you're supposed to like these characters Right? This was a whole genre of movies. And our idiot brother was one of them. And it had this song. Because Gen Xers needed an outlet to complain about their privilege, Danny. That's why. Uh, I didn't know that's what we were getting into. (laughs) I don't mind talking about that every once in a while. But of course I don't. I talk about it with you all the time. But I just wasn't expecting that to be the... (laughs) I'm purposely biding time because I'm trying to get back to the video. Here it is. I say, hey, what's going on? When you're hot and you're cold, not always easy to hold. When you're hot and you're cold, you yes and you no. <laughs> so I gotta tell you, when I first saw that this song existed. <laughs> Oops, I thought we were putting it in after and now we're talking. Sorry, I was just making it aside. That's okay. <laughs> So I'll tell you that when I first saw this song existed, I thought that like the idiot brother, because he's kind of like a hippie, would have some like lame song and that this would be a tie into that. Like here's Paul Rudd's character's lame hippie song. Mm. So I played, I clicked the video and I wasn't looking at it. And I'm like, yeah, I was right. This is a pretty bad like 60s approximation, like hippie song. Then I looked at the video. I'm like, oh, these are actual musicians. (laughs) And sorry to Mindy Smith. And whoever this guy is, Daniel Tashin. It's a very nice song. Once I I realized, yeah, it's a very nice song. But coming into it with that preconceived notion, (laughs) I did feel bad. I just understand, like 2011, like just having a soundtrack tie-in in in 2011 feels like really late, especially when it's this kind of movie and this kind of song. It's called. um, It's and it's just called "Taking You With Me." It's not called "I'm Taking You With Me." And here's a video of someone inviting a deer into their home. Oh, I've seen this before. He gave him a potato chip. Does this have something to do with Relying K? Or are you, no. just, you just letting me know? Oh, I okay. guess they're just like, because you like 
<laughs> this is from the Deer Whisperer. I guess, I guess they're like, because you like this. movies yeah. like My Idiot Brother, you'll like this deer. And he, he gets these couple of potato chips and he backs out. Interesting. It's very Woodland Forest or Woodland Friends. What is that? We still have to do that. <laughs> yeah, Woodland Forest. So now we can get into covers because there are no live versions of this song. No kind of alternates or anything like that. Here is the Nightcore uploaded by sort of under the radar. Oh, no, they have 31,000 subscribers. This is Rock Goes Nightcore. So this is a semi you know a somewhat popular nightcore channel as opposed to like just any random jerk like me just making a <laughs> nightcore <laughs> Right, so this song has, like, it opens with some of the aggression of, like, a devastation reform. And it has the it has the bridge of must have done something right. And it has this heavy, you know, the piano is high up in the mix, like a couple of other songs. Like, this song has so much stuff that is found elsewhere in the album. It's interesting. But what do you think of this Nightcore version? I like it. Do you think it's Let's better, see. faster like this? We have to wait till we get to the chorus. Yes. You do like it's it better? better sped up. But you know what's funny is that you said how the def the different parts of this song felt like they're from multiple st- separate songs. Mm-hmm. And I didn't exactly get what you meant. Like, I know I said, like, there's the DNA of multiple songs in this song. But I thought that the chorus to the verse and the verse the chorus, I thought that all flowed pretty well. But somehow hearing it in Nightcore... When the chorus started, I heard what you said earlier, how the chorus feels like it is from a 90 degree turn a little bit. Like the chorus doesn't exactly feel like it built up from the rest of the song. So here's something we haven't seen in a while. This isn't exactly an 8-bit cover, but it's kind of like that. This is a MIDI cover, and it definitely has whatever you know MIDI instrumentation is being put on top of this. It definitely has a video game like sound. Check this out. I love that, but it made it sound exactly like Come Right Out and Say It. Like, as I was listening to this, I was enjoying it, but I was singing the words to Come Right Out and Say It in my head. Okay. Interesting. I would go back to hear what you're saying, but I also want to hear this part of the song. This is great. (laughs) That's where it lost me. Again, just like the actual song. But the beat's different here. (laughs) It feels like it doesn't belong in this song. Gotcha. (laughs) Why don't you come right out and say it? Come right out and say it. I know. (laughs) The beginning part, but yeah. So it's fun. This, I forgot to say this is uploaded by John Flores. Flores with a Z. Uh, let's see what else here. Oh, here's a wedding performance. And I have something to say about this. A wedding performance? Like like a wedding band? Or no, like they're rocking like the reception? Friend. No, like a friend oh. is going to sing like 
a classy ish version of this song that we've seen before cool i don't remember what song but we saw like there was some song recently where it was like three different weddings had like a like a woman just singing this song to the wedding party cool to the wedding guests and the wedding party so this is honest wanderings version of the song and i'll have a comment about this So one thing, first thing. Oh my gosh, you're so, geez, let it play for two seconds, Danny. I will. First thing is, I don't think in the wedding performance it should have had the whoa, whoa, whoa's. Yeah, you'll hear it. Maybe I shouldn't give the, the my, okay. maybe I shouldn't be butting in with my notes ahead of time, but they needed to do something other than the whoa, whoa, whoa's and get to the song. Because once she gets to the lyrics, I think it fits very well. But I'm just like, the whoa, whoa, whoa's don't feel like they fit the tone, like, you could do a hum or just skip it entirely, but let's check this out. in his head along. <laughs> so two things there are two things and I didn't get very far into this video when I watched it originally just don't do the whoa o's it just the tone doesn't match the occasion do something else <laughs> or just don't or don't I do it I thought it was fine but... we hear covers where people cut out whoa o's and people cut out guitar solos and breakdowns all the time I don't know Jessica liked it I don't know it just didn't feel like it's too whoa in the middle of the church I don't know but then the camera pans from, and then she starts singing, and it feels appropriate, and it feels nice. The camera pans over to the bride and groom, and then, yeah, the, the best man is there. And he's he's not bobbing his head like you do to a song. He's standing stock still, right. shoulders back, like he's in a firing line. And he's, putting his, he's dancing his head like this, left and right. Left shoulder, right shoulder, well, I'm left sure shoulder. He's concentrating on just standing up and, and, and being the best best man he can be. I feel it's just a waste of time if I'm not with you. If home is where the heart is, then my home is where you are. But it's getting also hard to spend these days without my heart. So I'm taking you with me anywhere that I could ever. You know, and this is also called Pop Punk Wedding Song. I don't even know how I found it. I Somehow the algorithm knew I wanted this. Well, it's very sweet and, and does definitely work in like a wedding context. That's cute. One other thing I'll say about when you perform uh, like pop songs, pop punk songs, rock songs at a wedding, you know, it doesn't need to be three and a half minutes. <laughs> You should, you can also cut it down to like the two minute version. I don't know. What am I doing here? Armchair wedding. I have no idea. <laughs> I would have like, maybe slowed it down a little. That's my only note. <laughs> it would have been I would have liked to long. have hear, No, I just meant I would have liked to have heard like, you know, like a slower, really heartfelt version instead of just like keeping up with the, the tempo. Right. But it's still lovely. I got a lot of opinions on how people should... Wow, you sure do. <laughs> people should do songs at weddings. So here, I didn't know that about myself. I'm learning things about myself today. Well, I'm very glad we didn't have anyone do a song at our wedding then, Danny, because you would have had so many thoughts. I just think if you're going to do a wedding at a song... <laughs> <laughs> Oops. That's the thing I do. I just switch work. <laughs> She's over there. She's got an ass in her What? Daddy! Wait, what's down there? She's got an ass in her Daddy! From Boogie Nights. Daddy, we have to beep all that. You are in Boogie Nights when William H. Macy oh, is Daniel. complaining about how his wife's always cheating on him, and he flubbed the line in real life. He did it like I like switched the words. But they were like, ah, that's funny. Well, you're in good company then, I guess, dear. Yeah, I'm just like William H. Macy. Yeah, maybe don't, uh, when we do have children, don't try and Don't pay trust out you to just <laughs> to college. I'll be involved in the college tuition situation. 
So um, here is Seifert, S-E-E-F-E-R-T, with a very, very nice produced piano cover on SoundCloud. use soundcloud the soundcloud app for this podcast so the bummin cover that we found like two years ago was still in my history and i accidentally clicked it um let's go back to that because now this is how i would want this song played at a wedding this is actually very nice when i should have to leave i hope you know that i taking you with me see skipping the woes because it's you're slowing the song down you're making it a more beautiful sentiment of pure love like you gotta change things up a little this is very nice lovely everyone's doing a lovely job this week (laughs) let's hear it towards the end Every second that goes by is one more second of my life. And one more second. <laughs> in a butterfly. Oh, so, well, that song comes later. Yes. So it feels like this This is, this song kind of is like a catch-all. This is like the junk. Yeah. This is like the junk drawer. It's a kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah, this is like the kitchen sink. But, but all those things also sound negative, a junk drawer. Yeah, but this is like the collect, this is like the catch-all. Of- I don't know. Some places, ice cream places have that kitchen sink one and it's very tasty. Oh, okay. Or was that just, is that just the Disney resorts that Maybe used to do that? Maybe just the Disney resorts. I don't, I've never heard of that, but I believe that it exists. Um... There's a couple other interesting covers here. Oh, and I definitely want to play this one. So here's someone I finally get to talk about after two and a half years of doing this podcast. Little Red Guitars 2. I've given money to this person. I'll explain what I mean by that. But this is just a regular old guitar cover. As in a play along in the room while the song plays. While the record plays. Based on the posters in the background, I have a guess as to what you've paid them for. <laughs> right. So the the wall. So when I first clicked this video, I'm like, oh, their wall is awesome. It's just all it's two Blink-182 posters and a bunch of printouts of frames of like, like screen captures of Nintendo games. I'm like, that's cool. Then I look at the username. I'm like, oh, it's Little Red Guitars. So this was a mainstay of Blink-155. And then when they were constantly finding his videos, because he's done a ton more Blink-182 videos specifically. Mm -hmm. I knew he had done some Reliant K stuff, but I knew it was all guitar covers. So I never got around to looking at it or bringing it to the podcast. And then there was a compilation, like one of the first compilations that Blink-155 ever did of like fan material. I can't even remember what the theme was because that's a big thing they do now all the time. They've done tons of compilations of fan covers of all the different songs they've done. But one of the very first ones they did, David Park was going to contribute something to it. Oh, it was the punk. It was the free punk lyrics. They had a website. Josiah used to have a website called free punk lyrics. It was a joke basically where you go and you get free punk lyrics and then people started submitting songs and like we're gonna put a comp together because we've already gotten some songs put more together david park writes a song to set to some like purposefully like trite punk lyrics and then he goes and emails little guitar little red guitars and says can you put a guitar solo on top of my song because it'll be great because blink 155 has talked about this guy a ton and made fun of him and this guy has no idea who blink 155 is and but it was going to cost like 150 dollars or something like that like the guy wanted 150 dollars just to put a guitar solo on top of some song for some podcast fan compilation so like a bunch of us chipped in together so like i gave 25 dollars david had 25 dollars emily had 25 dollars so 
It makes me smile. It takes me down memory lane. Jessica's like, I couldn't care less. Yeah, you spent my $25 and didn't, <laughs> didn't tell me. I produced a song. I'm a music producer. I paid for that for that guitar solo. So we'll just move on and get out of here because it's already. Cause see, I well, no. Yeah, you've been you've been really just Stretching drawing it. <laughs> it all out, and yeah, now we're we're hitting our usual runtime. So Yay. congratulations. So now <laughs> I really thought we were gonna get out of here at like a tight fifty-five or something, <laughs> and yet no. <laughs> So let's talk about what we're really what excited on to talk earth about. What is this? What is this music? This is, is like this? an opening. You know how sometimes a- you know how sometimes AMVs have like a little opening intro. Mm-hmm. With that's not the song that the whole AMV is going to be set to. That's what you just heard there. I so, said uh huh, but I don't. Re- I don't really know that. <laughs> we have watched enough great. AMVs where like an AMV itself has like a five second sure. theme song, and it then was, it actually gets that was the definitely. AMV. A werewolf hedgehog grabbing a ring. That's what I saw in the hand. So, this Paw. is uploaded by The Diego Movies. And this is I'm Taking You With Me, Sonic and Elise Tribute. And this is something we definitely did not talk about two weeks ago. But, are oh you familiar? Gosh, he's got his own little... Production... Are you familiar with Sonic's human girlfriend from the 2006 game? Excuse me, what? No. What? Oh, no. Oh, no. Why are they running through the, like, Windows background from back in the day? Oh, you're right. It's the Windows green field. So this was a 2000... This was the 2006 attempted reboot at Sonic the Hedgehog, which failed horribly because they rushed it through and it was unplayable. But on top of being unplayable... It had these decisions aesthetically that they were going to make the universe kind of darker and more real, like Final Fantasy. So they thought a woman in a relationship with a hedgehog was exactly. more realistic. So she's a princess. And darker. So she's a princess of this kingdom that Robotnik wants to take over. <laughs> but what's so funny Sonic is Sonic smug, still smug looks like Sonic camera. in this game. It's not like sometimes when they reboot things, like they tried to do with the first design of the Sonic movie, like they tried to make him look more realistic. He still looks like regular Sonic. Just the world Would around you him want is him more Nolan esque. Like a more realistic hedgehog? Well, no. But it's just funny when he looks at this princess and smiles and picks her up and takes her from danger. And then they hold hands and lay in a green field. So this became a big like joke for years and years about the like bestiality subplot oh, of this no. 2006 Sonic oh, game. No, why is his head so big? His head is like bigger than her torso. Yeah. So. Oh, this is nightmare. But nine years ago, so in 2012, six years after no the game. No issue about it. It's just a nightmare. So six years after the game came out, the Diego movies was still rooting for Sonic and Elise, still shipping, still shipping that bow-legged princess and her blue hedgehog friend. I still can't get over them running through And guess the who voices background. Elise in the American game? Who? Oh, I thought we were going to hear her talk for a second. Mm. Christian Mingle star Lacey <laughs> Chabert. <laughs> See, it all comes together. It's all a little universe of... Reliant K, Christian Media, Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh, he's rubbing her back. It's so creepy. Even Ninja Turtles didn't go this far. Yeah, like sometimes the Ninja Turtles would kind of hit on April and she was like, oh, you guys, stop this. None of them rubbed her back like that, though. I'm trying to find the one where they like lay in the field. I don't need to see it. I've I've seen Anakin and Padme lay in a field. Oh, they're it's kissing. Fine. She's kissing oh, Sonic weird. to bring him back oh, to life. Oh, and now he's happening. supersonic. See, oh. Sonic just <laughs> needed to get kiss, kiss a human girl to go supersonic. Well, I'm so glad I got to bring Sonic back to the table tonight. So then I have a Doctor and Rose shipping video. Doctor Who and Rose nice. shipping video. Uh... I think it's mostly, I think it's both, it's both doctors. So this is interesting where, where to this, to this. Well edited. Yeah. To this opening guitar 
It saying, cuts every time. Dut, 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 dut. There's a cut on every dut, 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 dut. So it's Love Rose, it. Dr. Rose, Dr. Rose, Dr. Rose, Dr. But if you notice, it actually goes, what's the name? Eccleston. It goes Rose, Eccleston, or ninth. I'll say ninth and tenth. Rose, ninth doctor. Rose, tenth doctor. Rose, ninth doctor. Rose, tenth doctor. So that's a lot of edit. That's a lot of consideration in the editing. And it's just footage of... Sure. Of, uh, like, of Doctor Who. What What were you going to say? And then it's just footage of Doctor Who. I'm doing that thing where the wrong nouns come out at the wrong time. Sure. I was trying to say Doctor Who and I said Blink-182. Gotcha. You can see how they both they rhyme. rhyme. So, yeah. So you see how they get stuck in my, stuck in my brain that way. <laughs> Understandable. And then we have... And then tying it back into other recent events on this podcast... We have another shipping video. Oh, nice. It's Twilight. And I love this aspect ratio where they For took the wide screen. Esme and Jasper. That's a weird pairing. <laughs> no, it's fair. It's, and this is from 12 years ago. It's this Edward is from 2009. Bella. So just two just two years after the album, this album. Sure. And then a year after the movie. Right. They're already editing this together. Nice. I love the aspect ratio because they took the anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic. Gosh darn it! You are screen. on my account. Oh no! I'm gonna have to clear my history. They're gonna I'll be clear recommending your history. Sonic. Video. I'll clear your history. This is so much more interesting for me to have messed up oh. <laughs> Jessica's YouTube recommendation. Because I just looked underneath and I'm like, oh, it's. I'm like, why? Why is it recommending Sadie Hawkins Pod, a video that I would watch? And then I'm like. Because it's my account. <laughs> well. Oh, yeah. And I close YouTube and it keeps playing. Yeah. Because I'm logged into your account that pays for stuff. It pays <laughs> for premium. <itself>. Premium. <laughs> game changer. Absolute game changer if you watch uh, YouTube as, as much as I do. I just put it on in the background a lot. So. So there's also a banjo, co- so that's all the fan stuff. And then there's also a RuneScape video and a Bleach AMV and a Digimon Tamers AMV. Were you going to say Banjo-Kazooie? Because it really now, sounded like it. I did miss that there's a banjo cover. There's oh, a woman okay. doing a banjo cover. I'm slightly less excited, but I still want to hear it. There's three acapellas. Two by the Villanova Spires, who I kn- are some collegiate acapella group. And I know we've covered them before. But this apparently, this song stayed in their repertoire, which must have had repertoire, which must have had, they played it in 2007 and 2011. And you know that like how, like with the way schools work, that means there must have been complete turnover in that acapella group, like four years later. So why did this song specifically stick around for that long at the, for the Villanova Spires? Spires. Because they still have the same musical director. Oh, good point. Well, then there's the significant... I've seen Glee. <laughs> yeah, that's not something you want to go around admitting, but well, okay. Well, you know. <laughs> you saw it at the time. at the time. So then there's the significant others acapella group, which is a female acapella group. We could play that. Or we could play the banjo cover. What do you want to play? That makes me kind of sad, the significant others, because it's like it's like uh, the spy who dumped me, where it's like it's supposed to be this female-led movie, but it's still you're in the title. It's about the guy. Oh, right. They're all wearing the same, like, little black dress. Yeah, that's what you do in chorus. Were you never in chorus? No. I was in chorus. Oh. You know I can't sing. <laughs> Every time, multiple I, try, every time I try to up. sing you the bars of a song to help me figure out what song it is, you're like, I have no idea what you're singing. So, Jessica, what do you think of the song I'm Taking You With Me from the album Five Score and Seven Years Ago? Out? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you feel like this is a song that you're taking with you everywhere you go from now on? Or do you feel like this is a song that you can leave in the past with Sonic and his human girlfriend? I will happily leave it right with Sonic and his human girlfriend. <laughs> uh, so I would say I, I like this song now that I've listened to it and retained it. I like it a little less. I'm oh, sorry. really? Yeah. And I'm the opposite. I definitely like this song a little better, even though I have you know been so mean to i don't know why you sounded surprised by my answer i don't know i just i because i definitely enjoyed this song more for being a kind of like 
for being all the things that I've already discussed it being, I did enjoy it listening to it over and over. I kind of got it into my head a little bit more, and I liked it a lot more. But, you know, these are the ways things go. I don't know. Oh, the significant others, they're in like a a sorority. The Sigma O's. I get it. Oh. All right. Let's see what else the significant oh, others. No. <laughs> oh, they're, they're still going. Like this video is from 12 years ago. Yeah, but then I they have... it is definitely still going on. Yeah, in the but background. they're still going. No, I mean, the, the significant others acapella still has an active YouTube, and I will subscribe you to them right there. Oh, please do. Now not. you, Jessica, oh, are subscribed. He did it. He actually did They have sung two, years, two days ago, they sang Jesse's Girl by Rick Springfield. They had a Katy Perry melody, medley, medley, a Katy Perry medley. Uh, they had Valerie by Amy Winehouse, Trader by Olivia Rodrigo. S- hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of YouTube videos. Six years ago, they played Everywhere I Go by Five and Frenzy. Uh, they... <laughs> Oh, no, no, Everywhere I Go. That's an Amy Wine. Uh, Amy- oh, my God. Amy Grant song that the Five and Frenzy covered. Is this the is this the Amy Grant song? No, it's by wait, by Lissy. I don't know. Who cares? Whatever. I'm just, I just, I don't know, Jessica. Oh, oh my gosh, where were where are we cutting in there? You didn't give me an out. What the hell was that? <laughs> this episode just kind of fizzled out. Oh no! Thanks very it much, fizzled everyone. In too. Thanks so much to our special guest, former president, Jimmy Carter. Oh, yeah, Jimmy, come back in here and help us out of the podcast. Oh, no. I don't want to go anywhere near that microphone. You guys are weird. This is a terrible Jimmy Carter. 